Welcome to the policy panel of the 2020 Jobs and Development Conference. Employment effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Global South. What have we done so far? I could now send the director UNU wide and I'll be moderating this panel. The COVID-19 pandemic represents an unprecedented global crisis with far implications on the working poor in developing countries. We are now seven months into the crisis and we can already see significant negative effects on employment and earnings in the Global South. At the same time, several countries in the developing world have enacted ambitious programs to mitigate the effects of the crisis. In this panel, we'll take stock of what we know about the employment effects of the crisis, as well as the effectiveness of policy responses that we've seen so far. We have a distinct set of scholars and practitioners with us in this panel, and I'm going to introduce them now in, in speaking order. So the first panelist is Indira Santos, who is a global lead for labor and skills in the social protection and jobs global practice at the World Bank. The second panelist is Sangyan Lee, who is the director of the Employment Policy Department of the ILO. The third panelist is Marty Chen, who is senior advisor of Vigo, lecturer in public policy, Harvard Kennedy School, and the member of the wider advisory board. The fourth panelist is Harun Bhorath, who is professor of economics and director of the Development Policy Research Unit at the University of Cape Town. He's currently an economic advisory council appointed by the President of South Africa, an ISDA research fellow, and also a member of the wider advisory board. I would like the panel to speak to two questions. The first question, what do we know about the employment effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in the Global South? The second question, which policy responses have worked best in containing the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the livelihoods of the working poor, and what can be done more by southern governments and, and the international community? Two questions. I would like each panelist to speak for seven minutes, each in the inter uh, initial interventions, followed by a short round of two minutes each of responses and comments in each other's remarks. And then I'm going to open up the discussion to the uh, Q&A session and I've asked the audience to send your questions to me by the chat function that you see in front of your screen. Do not wait till you hear all the interventions. As you think of questions, keep on sending them. And I will collect them and ask the questions on your behalf. Also, do note that this particular session is being recorded. So let's start. And I would like to ask Indira Santos to make the first initial intervention. Indira, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, I will leave it to San Gion actually to provide us with a global picture on labor market impacts based on the ILO work. Um, but I think there's little doubt that many firms, workers, and families are hurting. According to World Bank estimates, the global extreme poverty um, rate is expected to rise for the very first time in over two decades. And as uh, we discussed in the previous session, impacts go well beyond poverty. The crisis has revealed the extreme vulnerability of those in formal employment who account for the majority of workers in developing countries. There are also concerns about a generation COVID-19 uh, encompassing recent graduates, first-time job seekers, and the unemployed who may be scarred in the long term from, from this crisis. Uh, women and youth in many settings are being also disproportionately affected, exacerbating some of pre the pre-existing uh, inequalities. Hard numbers are starting to come by in some developing countries at the World Bank. We monitor these impacts through our Jobs Watch initiative, which is based on high-frequency phone survey data on households and firms in more than 100 countries. By June, for example, in Latin America, countries like Colombia, Peru, Costa Rica, Ecuador, uh, around 25% of occupied workers report that they lost their job since the lockdown. And for most of all the countries monitored in the region, around 70% of households report decreasing household incomes. These employment impacts are likely to be long-lasting and may exacerbate um, a, as, the, as the support that countries have provided actually fades. In some industries that are an engine of, of employment, like tourism, effects are expected to last well beyond the lifting of the travel restrictions. Even when countries get COVID-19 under control, the global economy uh, is in recession. 
And, and finally, we expect structural changes in employment linked to changes in international value chains, for example, or the acceleration of trends such as the digitalization of commerce and business, and this will add to the employment challenge. Let me, add to, let me turn to the policy response. Um, I would like to frame it today as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Let me start with the good. Countries United reacted quickly and with unprecedented strength. At the World Bank, we count more than 1,000 social protection and labor measures adopted to date in response to COVID and virtually in every country around the world. 60% of those measures are associated with social assistance, mostly cash transfers, mostly new programs. Uh, a little bit more than 20% are social insurance measures, strengthening mostly uh, unemployment benefit systems. And the other 20% are largely supply side labor measures, uh, mainly wage subsidies, which, were, which have been put in place in around 80 countries uh, worldwide. Labor market support has come mainly in three forms, liquidity support for firms, measures aimed at preserving employment linkages, particularly through, through uh, wage subsidies, and income and in-kind support, such as transfers, intermediation, and reskilling for the vulnerable. I would argue that the jury is still out on the labor market impacts of these measures and the cost they may bring, not only in terms of fiscal uh, aspects, but also in terms of labor market dynamics. I think there are some positive indications, however. First, most of the measures put in place have some backing, I think, on what we know from the literature on impacts of labor measures during crisis. Second, the measures seem to have been effective in their immediate goals, protecting jobs, income, or both, among the targeted population. Across the OECD, for example, job retention schemes have supported over 50 million jobs, 10 times as many as during the global financial crisis. At the World Bank, we estimate that measures have also been uh, effective in alleviating poverty and welfare impacts. And finally, I think some of the fears of labor market disincentives, given the strength of the response, do not seem to be bearing out, at least yet, um, as emerging evidence, for example, from the United States around the CARES Act uh, seems to suggest. Now let me turn to, to the bad. Two points I would like to highlight. First, in terms of informal workers. While they, while they are the overwhelming majority of workers in most developing countries, most measures put in place in response to the crisis do not really reach this group effectively or at scale. There have been some efforts, cash transfers, linking them to microfinance institutions, but I think the crisis has shown the extent of the challenge and the limitations of our tools. Second point is I think the trade-offs between providing relief to households and firms on the one hand and supporting an economy's restructuring on the other becomes starker as the crisis and policies measure are extended. Think about policies that have protected jobs uh, like wage subsidies in, uh, in Europe and that have been imitated uh, around the world. There are clear, clear trade-offs here with the approach being kind uh, to workers and firms while the schemes last, but running a risk of supporting you know, zombie firms and jobs that may be unsustainable. I think going forward, it will be key for countries to shift away uh, and change the nature of the labor market support that they provide. I think the question is whether countries will be able to do this adequately. Support will need to become more targeted, less generous, and shift towards supporting job creation in promising sectors, re-employment and productivity, including transitions to, to new jobs. And I would argue, and we can discuss further later, that we are already seeing some of those uh, shifts. Now, um, the ugly. I think on my mind there are three big concerns. First is that the fiscal space for further responses is very limited, given that most countries went uh, bazooka on many of the measures, and there is an expected global recession uh, that will outlast the pandemic itself. Um, so I think going forward, uh, it will be ever, ever more difficult to, to respond to any new wave or further uh, needs. Second, it is becoming apparent that this crisis is generating structural shifts in the labor market, um, and that will become uh, increasingly challenging. And a third concern is that, particularly for affected groups in the crisis, women, youth, low skilled, um, a, many of the gains that have been made in the last decades could actually be, be lost, given concerns one and two uh, expressed earlier. Um, let me conclude on a positive note. 
There are many lessons, I think, from COVID-19 in terms of the strengths and weaknesses of policy responses to crises like this one. Um, at the World Bank, I think we are confident that this crisis will represent a before and after on how we think about productivity and protection of informal workers. We hope it will make us think more systematically about how to protect all workers independently of how and where they work in ways that move us away from systems financed mostly by labor taxation that effectively limit protection just to formal workers. We are also confident that investments that are being made today in terms of digitalization of service delivery, in social protection and labor programs, so digital IDs, digital payments, will also help make countries more resilient um, moving forward. Um, and with that, thank you very much for this opportunity. So thank you so much, Indira. Let's move on to Sangin Lee. Sangin, do you want to make your initial remarks? Uh, thank you so much, uh, the Kunar, actually, for your kind invitation. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as you know, the um, pandemic is continuing, actually, the, to evolve. And so the assessing labor market disruption at this moment, whatever we do, uh, involves quite a high level of uncertainty. So we have to live with it. And also, the when it comes to projecting what's going to happen in the, uh, the coming months, and especially in the second half of the year, it's uh, even more uncertain. But still, it's very important, in our view, to monitor and analyze the labor market impacts with the best possible data and method, and then updating on the regular basis. And it's a way of the helping the countries to develop timely and informed policy responses. Uh, this is why, actually, we have done a uh, lot of analysis through the IRO monitor on the COVID-19 and the world of work. Uh, we published so far the five edition. We are working on the next edition. It's going to be published this month. Uh, within, I have very limited time, so I just want to share the, some of the findings with you very quickly. Uh, but before doing that, I just want to uh, mention one uh, important premise for our analysis, which is about the Rather unsuccessful, in my view, unsuccessful experience from the Great Recession. Uh, probably, as you remember very well, the mainstream policy response at the time was largely characterized by, I mean, in my view, a bit trickle, trickle down recovery measures, which actually somehow result in another slow economic recovery and also greater social and political uncertainty. And also, you remember very well, the recovery in employment and the labor income was even slower and also more painful, I must say, which in turn contributed to the further uh, slowing down of the economy recovery and also depressing productivity growth as well. If we look at the global unemployment, uh, it took almost uh, 10 years, a decade, uh, to return to pre-crisis level. While Use unemployment, unemployment never managed to fully recover from the crisis. So in a sense, the economy and the uh, employment has been disconnected in the recovery process. Uh, similarly, this is an, you know, the very familiar story, labor productivity continue, continue to grow in the recovery process, but wages and the labor uh, income tends to lag behind. So as a result, all of this, the inequality uh, remains high. In some cases, it's growing. And this is why actually the crisis response was widely understood. Uh, a bit of the overall failure of the uh, trickle down economy. So I think important starting point for us in talking about the how to respond to this COVID-19 is that in my view, we shouldn't repeat such mistake in this crisis. So having said that, what is the overall magnitude of the labor market disruption? Um, in the beginning, actually, we used the very standard modeling, which actually predict annual average uh, rate of unemployment. And then it's soon very clear that the looking at annual and unemployment is insufficient. And in some cases, it's even misleading because the annual average do not reflect the reality as the situation is evolving very rapidly. And at the same time, unemployment does not indicate the actual scale of disruption for workers because many people actually keep the jobs, but they are not working. At the same time, they are lost the job, but they completely move out of the labor market. They do not search for jobs. 
and also the many of the uh, people are working short hours. So these are not very well captured in the standard unemployment figures. And at the same time, we need to uh, much shorter time horizon, like a month, a month or a quarter. So this is, a, is why actually we actually looking at the uh, working hour losses actually using uh, the now casting order, which takes full advantage of the high frequency data. Actually, let's look at the just second quarter only. Uh, initially, I mean, in the very beginning of the, uh, the, of the second quarter, we uh, uh, estimate around the 7% of losses in working hours, but over uh, the, the last three months or something, we made up all the adjustments. So we are now talking about 14%. Uh, of course, these like, actual working hour loss include in economic in activities and labor market withdrawal and unemployment, uh, temporary suspension of work and shorter hours, all of this. Uh, these actual like, working hour losses of 14% are equivalent to the 400 million full time jobs if we assume 48 hour work week. It's tremendous, it's unprecedented. All the reason, I mean, wherever you look at it, they, we also the or two digit losses. Uh, probably the largest reduction in my calculation is now in the Americas, Latin America and the U.S. But the, uh, uh, we just recently heard of, uh, from the India about the GDP uh, figures. So it's 14% uh, drop. Uh, so the, we think that the labor market situation may be the wor much worse than actually we uh, initially anticipated. Anyway, it's, this is the unprecedented scale of labor market disruption, which basically affecting every single person in every single country. And by the same time, these actually impacts are a bit disproportionate and also the um, making certain segment workforce is even uh, more vulnerable. So to demonstrate this, uh, the group, and let me briefly mention three groups, informal workers and youth and the uh, women. First, the uh, workers in informal uh, economy, uh, India already mentioned that. Uh, I'm sure the Martha Chen will uh, give a rather uh, uh, more detailed, actually, the picture of the situation. Uh, but as you know, well, the, the right now, the overall, the global workforce is around 3.3 billion. And out of that, 2 billion workers are engaged in the informal economy. Out of this two, uh, 6 billion, we think the uh, 2 billion, around 1.6 billion are estimated, in our view, are impacted by crisis. Uh, either because of the lockdown measures or other uh, other reasons. Uh, impact on the income and poverty for uh, the informal workers are very massive, and we expect, I mean, very first months of this crisis, I mean, without any government support, anything, the income of the informal workers may decline up to 60% uh, the globally. This actually massive income effect has much to do with the, the very nature of the pandemic, you know, the informality is often seen as the last reserve option for survival. But this option uh, is, uh, has often ceased to be viable because of the lockdown measures, which actually restrict the movement and economic activities. So this results in the high income risk for informal workers. Uh, that's informal workers. So what about the young people? As I mentioned earlier, earlier Youth unemployment uh, rate has never recovered from the, uh, the Great Recession. It's still, before the pandemic, it stood at around 13.6%. Now, of course, that does not include many more million workers who are not in actual education and training, basically inactive. But one of the defining features of this crisis is the simultaneous show. It's not just about the labor demand, lack of the work opportunity, at the same time, supply shock, because the young people, the learning opportunity are severely damaged as well. So on demand side, uh, we think around 178 million actually young people are working currently in the sector, which are hit very hard, hard by the, uh, the pandemic. And actually, we did some the, uh, survey with the, uh, some uh, UN agencies and, and other private sectors. In, in, in that survey, we, uh, we found one in six young people actually stopped working since the start of the crisis because of pandemic. And on the supply side of that is that the, in our survey, again, like this is done with the World Bank as well, and 90, more than 90% of Tibet institutions, they closed down. They shift to the, uh, the online courses. 
And of course, the online courses in the advanced country could be better, but in different countries, I mean, the, the, the quality of the online courses is quite a mixed at the moment. So which means we have a demand shock and the supply shock. If we can put together and this just continue, you have to, we have to expect quite a significant scaling effects. So if that is the, the case, uh, we are very much worried about the possibility of the lockdown generation. I mean, this young generation will uh, continue to suffer uh, throughout the, uh, their working lives. Uh, very quickly on gender is the same. The, our main concern is that the, all the gains we have achieved in the recent years in the gender equality in the labor market, those gains may is are already being actually uh, swiped out in many different ways. One is women are more likely to work in the the, uh, the hard hit sectors than men, and the second, domestic workers. At least more than 70% domestic workers do not have the good social security coverage, and they are at risk of the losing job. And also, women are represent more than 70% of those in the. Uh, the uh, women are representing more than 70% of the jobs in the health and social work. You know, these actually jobs are exposed to the direct risk of the virus and on top of the low pay and the poor working condition. And also there is a big concern about the care because of the closure of the early childhood education and also lack of the care support. We see the, uh, the over distribution of the care work within the family is more and more uh, the uh, working against the women. So it is more unequal than before. So let me, uh, let me conclude with some of the overall uh, the remarks. Uh, we very much hope this like, the pandemic will fade away in the second half of the year. We initially hope so, but I, I don't think that's going to happen because we see the more infection numbers in many countries and forcing still countries actually continue to rely on the local measures on different kinds. And the, there is a huge support from the finance support and uh, also the, this uh, is a very uh, important issue. When it comes to policies, I don't have much time, but uh, I want to mention one thing here is that the policy design is very important. I mean, the India already indicated very important elements in there. But we are more worried about the lack of the resources itself. And so in two ways, uh, one is the uh, in the case of developing country with a very limited fiscal resources, I mean, even though with the best policies, I mean, uh, there is no resources available at the moment. So how can you mobilize global support for a developing country? It's very important. The second, uh, the previous actual crisis, global recession, we saw the, how the premature fiscal consolidation uh, played out. So we simply don't want to see these uh, things will not happen again. So. We are very much uh, worried uh, the uh, advice against about the premature fiscal consideration, which would risk actually further destabilizing the already very weak at the labor market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angan. Let's move on to the next panelist, Marty Chen. Marty, do you want to make initial intervention? Thanks, Kunal. It's really a pleasure and honor to uh, speak on this panel. And as Sangan predicted, my, I will focus on the informal workforce and we'll draw on findings uh, from the WeGo network. We did an early um, rapid assessment. We've just completed um, a 12 city study and we have weekly contacts with organizations of workers. Um, just to uh, re-echo what Sangan said about the fact that 61% of all workers, 2 billion, are informally employed, and that there is a significant overlap. The, uh, the 2018 ILO um, estimates suggest a significant overlap between being informally employed and being from a poor household. And I would add that wherever we work, we also know that informal workers tend to be from disadvantaged communities by race, ethnicity, and caste. However, before this crisis and uh, for the last forever, I guess, policymakers tend to see informal workers, their enterprises, and activities as a problem to be dealt with. Um, and you all know that they are 
assumed to evade taxes and regulations, deal with illegal goods and services, represent unfair competition, have low productivity, and so forth. And the reality is that most of these informal workers are from poor households and are trying to earn an honest living in a hostile policy and regulatory environment. That's before the crisis. And as Songyan said, that ILO earlier this year estimated that 1.6 billion of these informal workers, 80% of them, um, would be negatively impacted in some way uh, by the decline in work associated with the policy responses to the virus. And that during the first month of the crisis, uh, informal workers globally would experience about 60% drop in income. So, Songyan, I'm happy to report <laughs> that the preliminary results from our 12 city study, we only have tabulation so far from eight of the cities. Um, and this was a study on the impact of the pandemic cum lockdowns on the livelihoods of informal workers. And we can confirm your ILO estimates. Um, in six of these eight cities, 80% or more of informal workers in the sample were not able to work during April. And April was seen in all cities across Asia, Africa, Latin America, and also New York City was in our sample and Pleven, Bulgaria, was the peak month for restrictions and lockdowns in all the cities. And the loss of income meant, I mean, loss of work meant right away loss of income because they rely on daily earnings. And the economic crisis overnight became a food crisis for these workers. So a common lament that we heard across uh, these cities is we will die from hunger before we die from the virus. Now, the two exceptions where 80% um, or more did not lose work, one was Bangkok, Thailand, where around half lost their work. But this was in large part because the street vendors and the motorcycle taxi drivers in the sample were assumed to be essential workers in that city and were allowed to continue in some way. And the other city was Dakar, Senegal, where we only studied one sector for a variety of reasons. And this sector was waste pickers, all of whom work at one large dump. And many of them are migrants who live near the dump, so they were able to continue to work. But I should add that even those who continued to work, um, you know, the incomes had plummeted. Uh, by late June, early July, after the restrictions had been eased in most cities, in half of the cities, half or less of the informal workers were able to resume work. And in the other half, which included Bangkok and Dakar, as well as Accra and Pleven, Bulgaria, between 80 to 90% were able to resume work. But again, the incomes had not recovered. Uh, they bumped up a little bit because they'd resumed work, but they were nowhere near the pre-COVID level. In sum, what we say is that livelihoods were immediately turned off where strict lockdowns were imposed, but livelihoods were not immediately turned on when lockdowns are lifted. I mean, recovery, like Sungjong said, takes a long time. And we know that because we also did uh, two rounds of a study after the global recession. So what is it that these informal workers want and need to restart their livelihoods? One is that they want recovery cash grants. Many of them have received emergency cash grants and that's been very helpful. Um, although we have lots of evidence that not all who are eligible did, but, but they want the cash grants to continue uh, because most had to deplete their savings and many went into debt. And so they simply don't have the money to buy stock and restart the businesses. Another problem is that the supply chains in which they operate are broken and those need to be repaired or restored. So if you're a home-based producer in a manufacturing supply chain, we, one of our sample cities is 
the t-shirt capital of the world, Tirupur in India. Um, unless they get the work orders from the factories and the suppliers, they don't resume work. And the factories were allowed to resume, op were allowed to open and rehire all workers in, in June, but they haven't because they haven't received the domestic orders or the export orders from, from that chain. So the home base workers are sitting idle still. Um, street vendors, if you think of the food supply chain, unless and until the natural markets of street vendors are opened, which they aren't in many cities, and the wholesale markets are operating again, um, and the farmers are able to produce and sell, that whole food supply chain is very vulnerable. And we see that operating. The recycling supply chain, street vendors have, I mean, the waste pickers have gone to work, back to work in many cities because their service is seen as essential. They help clean and, and reclaim waste. But unless the scrap dealerships and the waste recycling plants are reopened and the markets for these reclaimed waste goods uh, is not restored, they can be working but earning nothing. So we have workers who are working and earning nothing at this time. So these supply chains are really important. So it's not only the global value chains, it's not only the global economy, it's very localized as well, those supply chains. Um, and of course, they need increased demand. If you're a street vendor, you sell to people who um, tend not to be too wealthy and their incomes haven't suddenly bumped back up. So they're very worried um, about the demand. They need safe public transport. They're commuting to and fro work and they're being accused of being vectors of the disease but they themselves want to be safe, right? And so public, you know, adequate, safe public transport is hugely important to them to return to work. And then we want them to be um, not stigmatized as the vectors of the disease, which th there's increasing stigmatization. And we had a, a webinar with domestic workers from India last week and one domestic worker in Delhi put it, she says, quote, we don't go to malls and markets, our employers do, but they see us as putting them at risk. Well, while I put myself at risk working in their homes. So I think this sort of assuming that the poor are the vectors, um, we have disease and uh, a drag on recovery. We really need to fight that, um, that stigmatization. Um, and we do see um, that happening, that in the name of public health, in the name of recovery, we see a lot of flashpoints where informal workers are not being allowed to work or their, uh, their market infrastructure or their waste collecting uh, sites are actually being destroyed. There are a lot of flashpoints now. So it's, it's, it's not getting easier with, with, the, with the lifting of the restrictions. And as we all know, I just want to conclude with this, that the world is at an inflection moment. The, world, the economic system is in crisis. And the COVID crisis of the pandemics and the lockdowns have exposed economic injustices and inequality around the world. And more specifically, they have exposed that those who provide essential goods and services do not enjoy essential rights. Many of the health workers do not have health insurance, as most of them are informally employed. So if we're really going to reduce these economic injustices, inequality, and poverty, the global community needs to commit to several things. One, to investing in strengthening the supply chains for essential goods and services, the local systems of production and consumption, ensuring universal access to social protection and not just social assistance, social insurance as well, and good quality public services. They need to regulate markets 
to limit the power of capitalists to undermine the worker rights and to undermine the, the small uh, informal enterprises that supply to them. And we do need to redistribute wealth through appropriate tax policies. And finally, we do also need to end police and state violence against the poor and disadvantaged communities, including the working poor in the informal economy. We see and hear reports of police violence against these workers being exacerbated during this time. It goes way back, but it's also exacerbated. And this will require challenging the dominant narrative that stigmatizes informal workers as a problem, rather than recognizing their contributions in providing essential goods and services. So we need to build on the current recognition of frontline workers. We're clapping and singing for them around the world. So let's build them into our economic recovery plan. And we need to have a collect, you know, we recognize the basics now, it's really nice to be back to basics, <laughs> our collective need for essential goods and services. So we need to start rebuilding the economy from the bottom up. We can't rely, as Sanjan said, the trickle down doesn't work. We need to build it from the bottom up by extending legal and social protections to frontline workers and building more resilient and equitable systems for providing the essentials of life, food, housing, clothing, health, and education. And so, um, like Indira, I have a bad old deal, a worse new deal, or a better new deal. We have three choices, folks. We go back to the old bad deal for informal workers. We could very easily slip into a worse new deal. But what we want, I hope, is a better new deal for informal workers. Thank you. Marty, thank you so much. Uh, Haroon, would you like to make your opening remarks? Right, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Kunal. Um, now, in the run-up to the uh, organizing of the panel, Kunal set up three questions. I'll just sort of quickly um, reflect on them and repeat them and then uh, try and at least give you some thoughts based on the question. So the first can I ask is, what, so what are the climate effects of COVID-19 in the global south? The second is what policy responses have worked best in containing the effects of COVID-19 on the livelihoods of the working poor? And then finally, which I won't really spend too much time on because I'll run out of time by then, is what can be done more by southern governments uh, and the international community? So. Uh, just to be clear about the first one is, what do we know about the employment effects of COVID-19 in the global south? Now, of course, from uh, Sangyon, uh, uh, Sangyon and the World Bank sort of vantage point, there's a lot of sort of collation of data and so on, at least from the country level. And I should say, I sort of at least use South African data to, to, to anchor my comments. Um, a lot of the, the empirical estimates about the employment effects from COVID-19 will actually come from our Labor Force Survey data. Now, the latest we've seen from the ILO stats figures, for example, right, is there are about 168 countries that report in the ILO data having some sort of an, uh, a Labor Force Survey or another, right? There are only 39% of those countries, 65 of those countries that actually have regular Labor Force Survey data. And to be clear, of those 65, only 22 are developing countries. So you've got a really, really small sample of countries that are producing, developing countries that are producing regular labor force survey data. That's the core of what you need to actually empirically answer the question about what the employment effects of COVID-19. So if nothing else, there's a really important data point here is that the, uh, perhaps the biggest pandemic uh, the modern world has faced, right? Um, and, and the first key question, right, around labor markets, we can't actually empirically answer carefully enough just because there's a shortage of labor force survey data. I must add that of those 22 countries, only two are in Africa, and one of them is my own country, South Africa. So, so essentially, the, the, the question about, you know, if you think of it as a second quarter labor force survey question, which is between, right, April, May, and June, what were the labor market, labor market effects that we saw? Most countries can't answer that, right? 
And uh, if they do answer it, they're going to be answered pretty late. My own country will answer it hopefully by the end of October or end of September when the data is released. But the whole bunch of countries, uh, the large majority of whom we actually can't empirically and accurately answer that question. So with that in mind, just a sort of backdrop about the, the poverty of data, so to speak, are, are there ways in which, and, and this is really sort of for country level researchers perhaps, and for discussion and debate uh, at the end of the panel, is at the country level, what are the types of ways in which we can think about, almost a framework for thinking about the COVID-19 labor market <laughs> transmission mechanism? Um, <laughs> And there are a few, a few things that are really, really important for me, and I've seen them in different papers, but I think we, we need a better framework, and perhaps this is a challenge to Sangyon and Kunal, uh, Wider and ILO to start sort of a country research program. The first is, and we know that Oxford data has got this, which is the nature of the country, country level lockdowns, right? What is the length, the coverage, the sector reach that you're seeing across countries? Mm -hmm. Linked to that, but at the labor market level, is very clear estimates of essential workers. Because of course, one of the things that we need to start fine tuning is who's been affected and who's not. It's what I call sort of, I mean, in a, in a different depth sense is treatment and control groups, but the control groups are those who are not affected by lockdown, right? And mm -hmm. those are essential workers in the first instance, right? And those workers, healthcare workers, those working in food retail and so on, you need estimates of those, right? The second, and it's a particular issue in developing countries, is estimates about public sector workers. I haven't seen enough talk of how public sector workers are immune from COVID-19. They continue to be employed, they continue to earn the wage, at least in uh, developing countries I've seen those estimates for. And so the extent to which essential workers, public sector workers are special categories almost of a control group. And then from there, the sort of fourth key element is to provide estimates of those sectors and workers who were forced into and out of employment during the lockdown phases. And my phrase and my, my use of words is quite careful. There were phases of lockdowns, at least in South Africa they were, right? So in other words, in the phases, if you had a time-based estimate of months, right, that you calculated, you'd be able to see certain workers coming on stream relative to those who remain um, um, out of employment during the lockdown phases. Here, here's that we have for South Africa um, uh, based purely on pre-lockdown data, of course, right, is we have, for example, 4 million workers, that's 25% of uh, all the employed in South Africa would be categorized as essential workers. In addition, using the ONET type classification that we heard in the previous session, we have about a million workers that are able to work from home. So you have already some estimates and some sense in which you can start thinking about this transmission mechanism from lockdowns um, to, to labor market outcomes. I would argue that they, I haven't thought through this clear, clearly enough or carefully enough, there's some sort of duration function analysis that's required as we look over time, as workers come on stream into work. And if there's a reversion to higher levels of lockdown where the workers actually then uh, go back uh, out of employment. I also think in thinking through employment outcomes and firm effects, we do need to categorize far more carefully the type of firm effects that we've seen from COVID-19. So there are those firms that have not been affected at all, right, by COVID-19. And those are in financial and business services, private health care, uh, food and retail. Uh, there are work from home type categorizations, but they're also those that were stipulated by law in the country. And those firms would have been completely immune to COVID-19 effects. But then there are those who've suffered partial business disruption because of supply chain problems, whatever the case may be. And of course, those that have closed completely due to bankruptcies. I think there's a rich agenda around firm effects that we need to look at um, uh, in terms of its impact, uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 through, through uh, firm effects. Then. In terms of uh, the second question around what are the policy responses we've seen, and just be careful of my time, they, they sort of, the, the, the packages I've seen at least uh, across the developing world uh, have been health support, so water and sanitation, provision of PPEs and so on. What I think is very important, you've seen employment relief, tax relief, and credit guarantee schemes. very quick impressions about that. In the social assistance scheme for South Africa, which had the largest 
population in the developing world uh, into the COVID-19 expenditure, close to 63% of the population were reached by some form of new top-up social assistance um, to, to individuals, 63% of the population. But what had happened is they moved away, authorities moved away from a pure poverty targeting, targeting mechanism, so move away from social grants to looking at a broader range of workers that were affected by COVID-19, which may not be uh, synonymous with the same group you would target on a sort of pure uh, vulnerability basis. The second impression was on the credit guarantee scheme. You, uh, it was good uh, in the form of credit support to, uh, to uh, sort of provided through banks to small businesses. The problem was that the banks were then reapplying the same criteria for lending to small businesses that they were pre-COVID. So effectively, the banks, whether it was black-owned businesses, it may have been um, uh, informal sector businesses, definitely uh, non-traditional businesses for banks uh, were not supported. So you saw no change actually in the typology and the nature of the firm being supported through through this credit support uh, through this credit guarantee scheme, and that's a huge challenge. Um, of course, part of it is because banks were not willing to take on more more um, more debt and more risk in in such a difficult environment. And I think there need to be policy fixes there. The third impression is, unfortunately, in South Africa, is that health, the health support through government actually brought with it the renewed specter of corruption. So you saw uh, abuses of uh, of COVID, uh, COVID spending uh, in health, in particular, from unscrupulous uh, operators. So just very, very quickly, and I'll end here, is that for me, I think one of the challenges, thinking out of the box and for this panel to discuss, is to what extent can we think of different welfare criteria that uh, policy needs to focus on relative to what has gone before. And perhaps even in, in the context that we've seen from, from, from the panelists, there is a question for, for that, right? So Indira, um, Martha, and um, Sangyan have brought it up. That, and I'll leave you with one thought, is that in the context of COVID-19, if you were a grant recipient in South Africa, if you, the only form of income was a social grant, right? COVID COVID-19 did not change your income status, right? However, if you, were an income, if you were an informal sector worker with no grant coming into your household, COVID-19 moved your income to zero. Standard social assistance packages we have, say, in South Africa and in many parts of the developing world would have reached the first group, but not the second. And that's the concern we have is about how can we reinvigorate how we think about social assistance packages to be more let's call it COVID sensitive. Um, my final comment in relation to that is, here's one idea. What about a recovery program or stimulus package funded purely at firms that have actually gone out of business because of COVID-19? Um, and it seems to me that that's a fairly simple uh, targeting mechanism and we haven't, um, um, uh, I haven't seen that sort of being put on the table anyway. Thanks, Kanal. Uh, thanks, Arun. What I'm going to do now is to, I'm going to ask uh, each of you a question based on what I've heard from other, others' presentation. Let me start with Indira first. So Indira, one of the things that Sangin said, which I think is very important, is that we should, as we're thinking about COVID's effects in the short and medium run, we should not forget the human capital accumulation story of the long run. In other words, kids are not going to school, uh, and poor children are obviously having more di difficulty of getting access to internet and so on. So how do you see, if the bank has done so much work on this, that how do you see the long run effects of the, of the pandemic on schooling, human capital formation, and what can one do to make sure this sorts of effects are not, as, as Sangin said, uh, are scarring effects? Which are, because it will be terrible to see. Not only are we having these effects on the, on the working poor right now, but we might actually have a situation where this effects will carry on for years to come. So how do you see, the, from the bank's point of view, what can be done about this? Thank you very much, and thank you uh, to all. First to say that I fully agree with uh, your summary of the assessment and uh, and Sangon's point on, on investment in human capital. I think they, there are two big buckets of losses um, um, here. One is that comes from um, kids and frankly, young young people and adults not being able to attend schools um, due to closures. And I think the second one will be uh, an indirect effect 
through some of the coping me measures. I think there's a little bit of echo from somebody, not muted. Um, anyways, uh, uh, the second one will be, I think, indirect effects from some of the coping me uh, measures that households have been forced to take in terms of nutrition, in terms of depleting uh, assets. That inequivocally, I think the literature is very clear, these things uh, among vulnerable households have intergenerational effects and will affect uh, a human capital and labor markets later on. So what to do? I think at the bank we are focusing first on learning from the experience of the different processes on how to reopen schools safely, balancing the need for um, education and, the, and frankly, the also the, being a, the, the importance of uh, child care and children being in school for uh, labor force participation of, of, uh, of, pa of parents, uh, with uh, obviously the, the health risks. And I think the experience, countries have, are going at it. I, I, I live in Vienna in many different ways. Uh, and there's a, a richness in the information there that at the bank we're trying to put at the disposal of, of developing countries. I think the second thing that we are worrying about is that even when schools reopen, there's, there are a set of measures and supports that will still be needed for the most vulnerable. Uh, I think when we think about uh, children, given the circumstances and some of the evidence that we have from previous crises, some children may, may be required uh, to work um, at home. If incomes are suffering, more hands may be needed in the future. I think the, we are very concerned about the long, that the longer the closures go on and schools and children are not on schools, it's not only that you don't learn in the process, but you unlearn uh, a significant amount. And the, uh, there's clear evidence of that, especially for disadvantaged children. Um, and so the challenge will be when we reopen, how do we do remedial education, <laughs> given all the other things that education systems need to do and all the challenges? And lastly, we support, we are supporting countries on getting ready for providing financial support to households to accommodate some of these in, in, indirect effects that I mentioned. Uh, as Sanjian mentioned, our collaboration with the ILO in terms of youth education and TIBET. Um, quite a richness there in terms of how countries are um, responding, and we are aiming to put that information also um, to the benefit of, of our client countries. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Indira. Uh, I would ask Sankyun a question now, uh, based on what I heard from Marty. So as Marty said that there is now a kind of a moment where it could be a moment of transformation in how we look at the informal sector or informal sectors. Right? I mean, you can go back again once the pandemic's over, we go back to where we were and we forget about them. Or we take this moment and do we do something about their rights and so a social contract with informal workers. From your point of view and from the point of view, do you see that moment or do you think that's not going to happen? Uh, that's, a, that's a tough question. Um, the, um, uh, the, I think the, I just want to actually the, put this question in a context of COVID-19 very specifically uh, right now. Um, there are many ideas and the many policies and uh, about the uh, the informal workers. I mean, for me, as actually uh, Mark actually mentioned, uh, we cannot do everything at the moment. And uh, so it's very important for, in my view, to make sure the or the income support, I mean, what, from the whatever resources, from the government and community, whatever, uh, these actually the support should actually reach the informal workers at foremost. I mean, that's very, very important. How can we make it happen? That is the policy question we have to address at the moment. And there's a lot of the idea about the um, cash transfer or the cash actually grants, as actually Marta mentioned. Um, uh, there is a bit of the big concern about the delivery mechanism at the moment. In doing so, uh, there is a, some, uh, you know, the, um, the as Haru mentions about the risk of the corruption, in some cases, discrimination, as Marta mentioned, there are lots of things happening. But we have to really make sure what is uh, the, uh, the best, actually most effective, the uh, delivery mechanism without stigmatizing the informal workers. I mean, that's very important. That's one thing. Another one we have to mention is 
to think about is that the, of course, this is right issues and et cetera. But another very important dimension is linked to the what just Indra mentioned about the training and opportunity. Um, in my view, uh, it's very important. It's not too late. Trying to combine this actually social assistance program, especially cash actually transport or grant program, combine that with active labor market policy program, particularly training and learning. So in return for, I mean, it's not, not a good term, but we are giving, we are providing some income and because of these people normally just stay home without doing much. So we can combine that, actually probably introducing some training opportunity online or whatever to make sure they actually have some good opportunity to learn some new knowledges and new skills and et cetera, and get them prepared for the better opportunity once actually the opportunity arrives. I think that's a very important aspect. Of course, the real difficulty right now is because of all, of all these actually restrictive measures and lockdown measures, it's very hard to organize the the learning uh, the uh, learning at the moment physically. Um, but there are so many uh, very innovative ways of doing that using the uh, the communities and all other local authorities, and et cetera. There are a lot, lots of good examples. Why don't we actually uh, take a full advantage of that? Why don't we scale them up? Actually, for the much broader group of the informal uh, workers. So I start there. Thank you. Thanks, Angan. Um, uh, Martin, there's a question actually from the audience from Anne Fabry. Let me ask this question to you. So the question is that um, this is from Anne Fabry. The question is that have you seen, as you were doing the surveys in, in, in the several cities in the global south, situations where actually because of labor shortages, as migrants returned home, wages of workers who remained actually increased. So in this example that we have, flower production in Ethiopia, informal casual workers received higher wages after the crisis because of migrants leaving the, city, uh, leaving the cities. Do we have, did you have any counterintuitive uh, 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 effects of this kind, where actually wages increased because of labor shortages from the work that you've been doing with Vigo? What we found is that with the migrant workers having returned home in, let's say, a country like India, that the effect that we're seeing now is not that wages have increased, but different workers are being hired, right? So, and, but the factories and other firms are finding it difficult. So both in Surat and Gujarat, which is an industrial hub, and Tirupur in um, Tamil Nadu, which is an industrial hub, the migrants have not returned. And so it is um, other workers who are um, being hired, local, but the factories and firms do not have enough orders themselves to be hiring as many workers as they had in the past. And the wages, I don't think have gone up. We didn't, we haven't looked at factory workers, but that, that is my, my general sense. The other point about the informal economy is that well over half are self-employed, right? So that sort of wage effect is only going to apply to, you know, part of them and it's not the large part. Most of them are self-employed. And there they reply, they rely on demand for their goods and services, not their labor. So it's a, it's a very different equation. But can I just second uh, Haroon's point about needing labor force surveys? One of our big concerns, and we've worked with the ILO for you know, more than two decades, is that fewer and fewer countries are doing labor force surveys. And if I may say so with the World Bank partner here, um, that's because the donors tend to favor other surveys. And so the Living Standard Measurement Survey or some other flavor of the month survey is getting the funding. And um, I do think that labor force surveys are the best source of data on these issues. And when we look at data in like in Ghana recently, comparing employment figures from labor force survey and from the Living Standard Measurement Survey in that country, we had to go back to the labor force survey because the living standard measurement survey did not have enough 
of the indicators to capture not just the size of the informal economy, but its composition. So I do want to put in a plug for labor force surveys. Thanks, Marty. I have now, Harun, a couple of questions for you, which one uh, from Eva Maria Egger, my colleague in UNE wider. First is that it seems that the employment effects of the, of the pandemic is more an urban challenge, right? Because that's where the workers are dense, densely packed cities and so on. And given that South Africa is more urbanized than other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, do you see that as a specific problem for, sub, uh, for South Africa? And secondly, you also mentioned about corruption and targeting. Is that something from South Africa's experience using targeting mechanisms that you can, one can say about what, how effective they can be? especially when you have leakages and, and problems of, of uh, imperfect targeting. So two questions there. One is about a specific problem in South Africa because it's more urbanized. And secondly, what can you say about targeting mechanisms from the South African experience? Yeah, thanks, Kunal. I mean, those are great questions. I think that's precisely the kind of um, uh, <laughs> question, at least the first one in terms of urban and rural, uh, outcomes that the labor, labor force survey type data will answer, right? But I think the the hunch is correct that you're probably likely to see bigger effects and um, sort of, uh, let's call it job destruction in urban areas um, relative to rural areas. I'm cautious about that because of inter-household transfers, right? So, so you may find as a first order effect that jobs are lost in urban areas, Obviously, because you know, as long as you're not an essential worker or a public sector worker, uh, you are you are in trouble, right? In terms of the effects of lockdown. Um, but that being said, you may find that the aggregate poverty effect, when one combines household transfers and when one thinks about um, uh, movement between urban, uh, sharing between urban and rural areas, that the overall poverty effect may be. Uh, to witness in a poverty level in rural areas that are higher than urban areas. I, I have no sense of that. And I think we, that's why there's sort of strong call for real updated labor force survey data. I know we always talk about data, but this seems to be a really important point um, uh, sort of in terms of a, a, a massive economic shock us to be thinking about that type of data. Um, and then the second, the second question is an interesting one. Uh, for South Africa, because uh, and because of the time, I didn't specify this clearly enough. A lot of the corruption we've actually seen, and let's be clear, it wasn't the same as we've had in the last decade under the state capture years, but we certainly saw Arun, this is your connection problem, it seems. Uh, Harun actually warned me there might be internet problem at some point uh, while you were speaking, so that happened. So let's hope that we can get, get him back online. Um, what I would uh, um, PPEs. Oh, so right. it was the protective personal protective equipment. Yes, I can hear you now. Am I back? Okay, sorry, we just we just had a power failure, and I had to sort of reconnect all the Wi-Fi um, gadgets and so on. Okay, so as I was saying. In terms of corruption, it's mainly been for personal protective equipment. The, the question about social assistance is interesting in terms of targeting is that it turns out that in the process of widening the social assistance support scheme away from just, not just, but uh, um, in addition to our existing social grants, which were very progressive, child support grant in the old age pension, um, to what is called the COVID-19 grant, which was essentially anybody who was unemployed or lost the jobs because of COVID, we early evidence shows positive and negative effects. So we've seen less support, of course, to those right at the bottom of the deciles in terms of household income. But in fact, an increase in the distribution 
uh, of uh, income reaching those in decile four, five, and six, which is in a high inequality society like South Africa means that you've actually reached vulnerable households. A lot of the informal sector work workers, domestic workers, farm workers are actually in their cells four, five, and six. So, and this is my earlier point about changing or thinking about arrangements that are not just purely about uh, Let's. I've got a question of all panelists from Ian Walker of the, of the World Bank. This is a, a big question. So the question that Ian asks is that it is clear that exist, existing social protection insurance schemes have done a poor job, especially low-income countries, to protect either jobs or workers in the face of the pandemic. So how can we achieve effective universality, and what should be the role of fiscal resources versus those of employers' obligations, such as mandatory severance pay? achieving real universal protection for workers who lose their jobs or incomes? This is a big question. The role of universal provision to, to the state versus employers' obligations. Um, clearly, this is probably more relevant in Latin American countries, but also relevant also both in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and also in, in Asia. Who wants to go first to answer this question? Sangan, do you want to try and uh, respond? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a tough question. We we have been discussing these issues for almost uh, I don't know how long. I mean, probably the beginning of the social protection system itself. Um, the I think mean, we need to consider the some of the policy context and also debate here. Uh, when it comes to how can we uh, strengthen some of the insurance part of social protection, for example, how, how we can make sure the, there is strong contribution from workers and the companies, uh, that all relates to issue of the of the how to formalize or all the the conventional issues. Uh, that's an important debate. But at the same time, in this uh, the pandemic, there is a, a bit of the uh, strong suggestion. To somehow delink this actually contribution part, a bit insurance part of social protection, and then basically, uh, you know, the more pointing to the some idea of of the, the um, you know, universal income idea. Uh, I think these two are now right mixed, so that's why the, the debate at the moment seems to be quite difficult. As far as we are concerned, actually the. Uh, the, of course, all the difficulties uh, of the social protection in the low-income countries, uh, but somehow in many countries, I think the, the pandemic clearly demonstrates how important social protection system is for uh, people in this kind of situation. And so the, I think the, if we, we do a much better job actually to strengthen social protection system, uh, I think the, uh, there is a huge potential of the, uh, the helping uh, the uh, income support and at the same time, potentially also the strength of the role of the automatic stabilizer as well. Having said this, how can we uh, do that? Obviously, I think the, uh, we need uh, much more public uh, resources or the public support to actually scaling up the social protection. Uh, just relying on the contribution from the, uh, the companies and workers is a good start. But when, when you go there, I think we need a very strong support from the, uh, the public and the uh, resources and from the society. Uh, that's obvious. I mean, but that whole debate about the, what is the best way of the, uh, what is the um, uh, strategy financing for the social protection, um, there is a huge debate on that. But I think in my view, it's really good time to discuss the how to strengthen social protection to respond to all different types of shock, including this kind of shock, rather than, you know, the uh, discussing some some of the grand new ideas and then which will have some effect of dismantling 
social protection system. And lastly, as the, the delivery mechanism, social protection system has a lot of the potential. For example, the uh, Marta mentions the, all the backdrop of this uh, delivery mechanism or exist system when it comes to uh, the cash um, the grants or cash transfer. Uh, we know lots of the good examples where uh, they actually using the existing source of protection mechanisms to channel in at the uh, new resources for the uh, cash transfer. It's the effective and also, of course, it is not free from the corruption and also the all the inefficiencies, but the uh, uh, that weight will be much lower than the in other situation. Thank you. So, so the, my question to Indira then is, Indira, do you see the uh, much more stronger reason, the crisis where one should try and boost universal basic income? Is this a moment where we actually see this moment to try and bring in universal basic income, or do you think that's still premature? So I think the I think this is the moment to ask the question of how do we expand not only social assistance as was mentioned but also social insurance, which will require a change in the financing, uh, as was alluded by Sanjay, uh, moving away uh, from this only based in in labor taxation. Now, how do we do it? Uh, it will be a question of cons of fiscal constraints. We have done in a recent publication at the bank. Uh, actually, in two recent publications, estimates of how much it would cost to uh, to put in place a UBI, and you know, in, for in some countries, you are talking double double digit percent of uh, of GDP, a 15, 20 percent in some of the low income countries, which will not be realistic uh, immediately. And in the absence of a tax system that is able to claw back the resources of the top, you know, the progressivity that you do need for this type of policies. Um, uh, to work with would be very difficult to implement. That said, I think working on the two points of boosting social assistance, even gradually as resources become uh, available, and working on mechanisms that provide social insurance, which will require also government subsidies uh, for the majority of workers who do not have an employer or where we cannot assess income, um, I think is the is the is the way to go, and countries will have different mixes, and that's I think uh, okay, and we need to learn from that. I have a question from Sarma Vidisha, who's based in Bangladesh, and I'm going to ask this question to Marty. Uh, so Vidisha asked that, as we know, Bangladesh faced a double shock. First shock was, of course, the spread of COVID in the country itself and the return of migrants, and the second shock was a big collapse in demand for garments worldwide. And as one knows, uh, Bangladesh major exports is garments. So Vidisha asks that how does one handle this? Does one use the foreign exchange reserves that Bangladesh had to try and cushion the shock? Or are there other mechanisms in this case when a country is going through this double shock, one a domestic shock, and also another which is a more international to do international trade sh shocks? Would you what what would you advise here, Palmati, in this situation? Well, I think Am I am I being heard? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I I start with the worker, and then I work up towards what the government or the employers need to do. So for the double shock for the workers, we do need, as uh, Songyan has also said, that we do need some kind of income support um, during the crisis. What that means for the country to decide on um, how much to rely on a single sector for export, um, I think is is a big question for Bangladesh. It used to be jute, and then that, then it was garments, um, and and how much you rely on a single sector is a big question for Bangladesh strategy. But for the short term, I think there needs to be pressure. Um, on the lead firms in these supply chains for the garment industry. There has to be pressure on these lead firms. We know we're leave, living in an era where, you know, the, the CEO of the lead firm earns thousands times what the workers own. There's, there's how much profit can, can we let them absorb without having some responsibility? So I think a lot of pressure needs to be put on the lead firms in these uh, supply chains during these shocks to also kick in, not just the government um, to kick in. And I think that's a 
a point where we need more emphasis because, you know, a very large percent of international trade is sort of unregulated and untaxed and um, there's huge profits being made that could be um, recycled back into um, the workers at the lower ends of the chain. So I don't think it should just be fall to the state, which in turn falls to the taxes of the people. I think the the companies uh, need to be um, held accountable for workers in their chains, uh, even if they're not based in that country. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. I'm going to ask uh, Arun, this is the final uh, question. Uh, did you want to reflect a little bit on the universal basic income issue? Because I know that's been quite a bit of discussion in South Africa about it. What are your views? Great, thanks, Kunal. Um, and apologies if it comes to unclear. Um, I've got bandwidth issues, but but in essence, my my sense would be, of course, there's been a clarion call for move income grant or universal income grant. Uh, for me, the lesson seems to me let's not fix what isn't broken and that's in the form of highly effective social assistance packages in Latin America and in South Africa and so on, and instead look at support packages that do not get to those workers currently by social assistance. And social assistance packages that are ready to be rolled out, for example, to mitigate against fiscal pressures, when a shock hits like that of COVID-19. I, I don't think, it's not clear to me that we should immediately then roll onto a, uh, at least a universal income grant for a high inequality society like South Africa would have massive leakages, right? Um, but if you redirect some of the additional expenditure towards targeted COVID related, or let's say pure economic shock related uh, affected workers below some level of vulnerability, I think you, you've got something interesting there. Good. Uh, we are now past quarter of the hour, so we should now call this panel to a close. I want to thank uh, Indira, Sangyan, Marty, and uh, Haroon for this for your very interesting presentations and the way you answered, responded to the several questions we got from the audience. It was a really, it's, I think the perhaps the most important thing that we need to understand is that we're still feeling a way in understanding the employment effects of the of the pandemic because, as Haroon mentioned, we don't really have the data we need. And I think that's really important. It was good to see in this earlier in this in this conference today, we had some really nice papers on the pandemic's effects using different methods, of course, um, on this. And I think we need to have, so this is where I feel for this for those who are involved in this conference, which are mostly the labor economists of the of the world, try and do some more work on this, perhaps using more the kind of labor force service that Haroon mentioned and the kind of work that uh, that Marty and Vivo are doing on the ground work. That's very important. I think that's essential for the next few months. The second thing we really need to understand exactly are the policy responses. I think we still are somewhat in the dark because we got some sense of how some of these policies seem to work. But we also know that for, for a lot of informal workers, this, this, particular, this particular kind of programs are not reaching them very well. I need to think exactly as, as Marty said, that how can we use this moment as a transformational moment for the world economy? Because Otherwise, if we don't learn from this crisis, then one has to say that the next time another, another crisis hits the world, as Sangin mentioned, we had a similar, not the same kind of crisis, but different crisis sometime back, the global financial crisis, we'll never learn. And I think that's important how we can use this moment to learn and to do something that is going to be doing a, some kind of a significant shift in the way we think about work, informal work, and, and how we deal with low-income workers in, low, in, in developing countries. So let's hope that can happen. And thanks so much for your participation. And we've got some really excellent questions from the audience. And uh, I'm going to call this panel to a close. Thank you, everyone.